and welcome to this conversation about super PACs. As everyone from comedians to federal candidates know, super PACs have changed the relationship between money and politics. This year alone, they've spent over $33.2 million, at least as of noon today, uh, and raised an even larger, albeit currently unknown, unknown amount of money, some of it from original donors that we'll never be able to identify. So the focus of today's event is on what the public knows and should know about super PAC activities. We're going to look into the legal and policy implications of dark money flowing in unlimited amounts into presidential and congressional elections with particular attention to whether more transparency is needed. Today's event is hosted by the Advisory Committee on Transparency, which is a project of the Sunlight Foundation, and you can find more information about us at transparencycaucus.org. I'd also like to thank Representatives Daryl Issa and Mike Quigley, the co-chairs of the Congressional Transparency Caucus, for giving us this room and helping us to hold the event today. I'd also like to thank C-SPAN for coming and broadcasting this live. And if you'd like to join in from the conversation, if you're not in this room but you're watching on TV, you can go to Twitter, hashtag SuperPACAct. Uh, and just before we move on to the panelists, I should disclose that the Sunlight Foundation has released a draft bill called the Super PAC Act, which is unrelated to the Twitter uh, hashtag, but it happens to be the same, uh, which would tie in disclosure requirements. The public has been invited to comment on the legislation by visiting publicmarkup.org. And along the same lines, you can see the Sunlight Foundation reporting on Super PACs at sunlightfoundation.com slash Super PACs. So moving on to our panel of experts. So the first one, all the way to my right, who has been stuck in today's horrible traffic but will be here shortly, is Mimi Marziani. She's the counsel for the democracy program at the Brennan Center for Justice at New York University School of Law. Uh, to my immediate right is Eliza Newland Carney, who is a staff writer for CQ Roll Call, and she covers the issues of lobbying and influence. And I have it on good authority, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that you also coined the term super PAC. That's correct. Uh, to my immediate left, that's pretty cool, by the way. Thank you. To my immediate left is Paul Ryan, the FEC Program Director and Associate Legal Counsel at the Campaign Legal Center. And finally, all the way to my left is Alan Dickerson, who's the Legal Director and Interim Executive Director at the Center for Competitive Politics. More information about our panelists is available at transparencycaucus.org in case you want to learn uh, their full biographies. And of course, I'm Daniel Schumann, Policy Counsel with the Sunlight Foundation and Director of the Advisory Committee on Transparency. So I've asked each panelist to speak about different aspects of super PACs, and I'm going to turn uh, first to Eliza uh, to talk about a little bit what's available in the public record, what's absent, and how the information that's available affects the stories that reporters can tell. Thank you. Thanks to the Sunlight Foundation for having this event. Well, in the movie, All the President's Men, the character known as Deep Throat, tells Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein to follow the money. And even though that was actually not a line from the book, that was something that a screenwriter wrote, um, it became kind of a rallying cry for generations of people who care about transparency and accountability. But I think it's fair to say that it's more difficult now to follow the money than it once might have been. And there are a number of reasons for that. Um, the truth is transparency has been eroding for some time now. It's not just because of the Citizens United ruling. My own view is that the greatest threat to transparency, if you could call it a threat, is the increase, uh, increased activism and political engagement of nonprofit groups. As I'm sure you guys know, the Internal Revenue Service doesn't require nonprofits to disclose the source of their spending. Uh, there really are minimal disclosure and reporting requirements. And that's probably for very good reason. Uh, and it dates all the way back to the civil rights era when the IRS wanted to protect uh, groups that were active in issues like uh, civil rights and, and protect the anonymity of their donors. Uh, but nonetheless, um, beginning with the 527 organizations in 2004, uh, we've seen really millions and millions of dollars flow through nonprofit groups of, of different types uh, to be spent in arguably campaign oriented fashion. Now, the 527 groups did disclose everything to the IRS, so eventually you saw. Um, the money and where it had come from. With the advent of super PACs, I would argue that there are a number of new transparency challenges that have been presented. Um, and super PACs present special transparency problems, in my view, for three reasons. Uh, one is that the FEC disclosure regulations are arguably incomplete. Um, to some degree, the FEC has basically said that unless a donor earmarks uh, a contribution for a particular campaign expenditure, 
the organization, the super PAC, doesn't have an obligation to report that. So you could theoretically have a donor give money to a group for overhead and say, well, this wasn't really for a specific ad. And so we, the, the members of the public, wouldn't necessarily know uh, who funded that group, even if a lot of the money went to a particular campaign ad. And the latest crop of super PACs have found ways to at least delay reporting their receipts at key junctures. And a great number of them, excuse me, I want to say hi to Mimi. Hi, Mimi. Hello. How are you? Welcome. <laughs> I'm very well. We jumped in, so I'm going to keep talking for yeah, a few no, minutes. Yeah, I think that's good. good. Okay. As a civil rights attorney, I had a little, uh, the First Amendment slowed me down a little <laughs> bit today. There you go. So um, the super PACs, many of them have decided that instead of reporting on a quarterly basis, they're going to go to a monthly reporting. This was months into their having formed themselves, which counterintuitively has meant less disclosure right on the eve of these important early GOP primaries. Because when you disclose quarterly, you have to do a pre-primary report. But if you disclose monthly, you don't have to do that. So by going to monthly, they now will disclose on the 31st of January. And lo and behold, a great many primaries will be done by then. So that's been a challenge. Um, the third is the use of nonprofits. As I alluded to earlier, a number of super PACs have established affiliated nonprofits. The leading example right now is the um, Crossroads operation. There's a super PAC known as American Crossroads, which has an affiliated nonprofit, a 501c4 social welfare group called Crossroads GPS. These two groups together have predicted that they plan to raise and spend on the order of $240 million in this election, which is actually twice as much as they predicted they would be spending originally. And my guess is that a pretty good chunk of that, maybe half of it, maybe even more, is going to go through the nonprofit, which means that we'll never know where the money came from. Uh, I shouldn't say never, because journalists have been pretty good, actually, at finding out the source of a lot of these uh, donors and donations. But nonetheless, it's a lot more challenging, and it's not immediately evident. Um, and there's another trend that has to do with nonprofits and super PACs, which is that some super PACs have actually been accepting donations from nonprofits. So, you know, even if the super PAC discloses and says, here are our donors, and one of our donors of X million dollars is this nonprofit group, you still don't know who funded the nonprofit. So um, that is one of the third, that's really the third transparency challenge attendant with super PACs. Um, so it's not as though following the money is impossible, but it is a lot more challenging than it used to be. And I do want to slightly rebut some of the election lawyers I talked to on the eve of Citizens United because I would raise questions around transparency and I was frequently told, well, super PACs disclose everything. And I, I just, I'm here to say, you know, a conventional political action committee, every dollar in and every dollar out, if you're a journalist, you can go and look at. And that's just not the case with super PACs, at least not now. So uh, with that, I'll pass it on to Mimi. And so, uh, obviously, most of our conversation today is forward-looking as we grapple with the very important questions that super PACs have raised um, about how they should be, whether they should be regulated, how they should be regulated, and, in fact, um, whether basic assumptions underlying our campaign finance system make any sense. But before we can fully grapple with these questions, I'm here to... Uh, push us back a little bit and, and look behind us and make sure that we all understand where these super PACs came from and the legal theories and assumptions underlying them. Uh, and so I'm going to give you a little bit of a creation tale. It won't be too long, though, I promise. Uh, although things actually started in 1976 with the Supreme Court's decision in Buckley v. Vallejo. And even though this decision um, is now somewhat dated. Its main pillars remain the law today, and there are three points that are particularly important for the instant discussion. First, the Buckley Court found that because money is needed for most forms of mass communication, restrictions on political spending should be heavily scrutinized, just like restrictions on pure speech. And it's important to note, this is not actually the same thing as saying that money is speech, although that's the shorthand that has come from the decision. But it has the same practical effect. 
meaning that the government must have a very, very, very good reason to regulate political spending. The court in Buckley then went on to uh, decide that preventing corruption is basically the only very, very, very good reason the government can put forward to limit political spending. And then finally, the court decided without citing to any evidence or, or really talking much about the realities of political campaigns, the Buckley Court decided that direct contributions to candidates pose a much greater risk of political corruption than independent spending that is meant to benefit the candidate. And the court specifically said, and I'm going to quote the Buckley decision for a second, that the absence of prearrangement and coordination of an expenditure with the candidate not only undermines the value of the expenditure to the candidate, but it also alleviates the danger that expenditures will be given as a quid pro quo for improper commitments from the candidate. And so with that reasoning, the Buckley Court upheld contribution limits, limits on direct contributions to candidates, but struck down limits on how much an individual could spend to benefit a candidate. So fast forward to 2010 and the Citizens United decision. So this decision, as everybody in this room surely knows, is best known for its holding, namely that it is unconstitutional to prohibit corporations from using general treasury funds for electioneering. The court, however, also discussed independent spending um, and an aspect of the decision that is more frequently overlooked. And the Citizens United Court, in fact, expanded the logic of Buckley significantly. And it proclaimed, uh, again, without looking at any factual evidence, that truly non-coordinated expenditures, quote unquote, do not give rise to corruption or the appearance of corruption. And so, in other words, to give a concrete example, and this is the same that saying, as saying that a million, multi-million dollar campaign ad blitz funded by, let's say, BP Oil to benefit members of the Energy and Commerce Committee does not pose any sort of threat of political corruption, so long as BP to spend, decides to spend that money without consulting with the candidate. Um, with this, however, the court assumed that there was robust transparency that would also act as a mechanism to uh, prevent corruption. Three months after Citizens United was decided, actually, excuse me, two months after Citizens United was decided, the D.C. Court of Appeals decided a case called Speech Now, and I promise I'm getting to the point. Here, the big question was presented. The plaintiffs in that case said, I'm an independent, or I'm a, I'm a PAC, I'm a political action committee. I only want to spend money on independent expenditures. I'm not going to coordinate under the campaign finance rules with any particular candidate. Therefore, it is unconstitutional for the government to still restrict the money coming into my organization. There's absolutely no anti, or you know, so the argument goes, there's no anti-corruption benefit um, to restrict the money coming in if the money coming out is per se non-corrupting. The court agreed and tossed the limits on contributions to these types of PACs uh, aside. And so from this decision, the FEC created a new category of entity, and you might have heard this, this term already, but I kind of love to say it, the independent expenditure only multi-candidate, non-connected PAC, which obviously is a mouthful and I believe was recoined by our friend here as the super PAC. Now you know why I came up with that term. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the other, the other name's so catchy, but. And so as we, uh, I'll, I'll let us move on to our other panelists. But from that, that creation story as it is, I just want to underscore three particularly troubling assumptions that super PACs are based upon. One is this idea that independent expenditures are non-corrupting. I mean, this, this notion is quite frankly ludicrous to anybody who's ever dealt with the realities of you know, our political system. 
Um, I mean, I think it belays all logic to think, uh, for instance, that an individual could give $5 million to my closely affiliated super PAC. I know all about it. That infusion of money is, let's say, given to me at a critical moment in my campaign and necessary for me to achieve a key win. I, it is crazy to think that I will not feel indebted to that individual in some way. The second fallacy is this notion that the coordination rules are sufficient to prevent true coordination, the way that you and I understand coordination. And we're going to talk about that a ton, but um, just that they are not sufficient. And then finally, as Eliza highlighted, the, the third fallacy is this idea that the current disclosure regime is sufficient to capture this new influx of political money. And I'm going to end illustrating that. I think the best is Stephen Colbert. Have you guys talked about him yet? Not yet. Well, so as many of you probably know, comedian uh, and genius Stephen Colbert has been illustrating some of um, and kind of ridiculous aspects of the current regime by creating a super PAC. And he created an affiliated 501c4 named the Colbert Super PAC for the purpose, of course, of accepting donations that never have to be disclosed and then can be shifted to the super PAC. So with that rather sad tale, I will turn it to somebody else to hopefully offer a ray of hope. <laughs> so uh, Paul, hopefully you can, uh, I don't know if offer a ray of hope, but certainly help uh, explain some of the, the concerns here. And, and maybe we should note that uh, Colbert no longer has the super PAC. Oh, that's, that's right. It's now just his good buddy, uh, John I think Stewart. it's defi definitely not coordinating with Stephen Colbert, super PAC. That's right. So Paul. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the broader legal concerns at play when you're talking about disclosure and transparency. So as Mimi and Eliza both explained, one of the things, the major thing coming out of the Supreme Court's decision in Citizens United was a declaration by our Supreme Court, by five justices, that independent expenditures don't corrupt or can't corrupt. But one of the promises made by the court, promise might be too strong of a word, but one of the suggestions strongly made by eight of the court's nine members was that disclosure and transparency would be an antidote to any potential corruption from this flood of corporate and, by extension, union money that would be coming into our election system. Uh, so eight of the court's nine justices signed on to a section of the opinion that stated, for example, a campaign finance system that pairs corporate independent expenditures with effective disclosure has not existed before today. Later in the same paragraph, they went on to write, with the advent of the internet, prompt disclosure of expenditures can provide shareholders and citizens with the information needed to hold corporations and elected officials accountable for their positions and supporters. And skipping ahead to the end of that same paragraph, the court concluded, the First Amendment protects political speech and disclosure permits citizens and shareholders to react to the speech of corporate entities in a proper way. This transparency enables the electorate to make informed decisions and give proper weight to different speakers and messages. So eight of the court's nine justices strongly stood behind disclosure. And this wasn't the first time. In fact, eight of the court's nine justices have been strongly behind disclosure in all of the court's recent disclosure-related decisions. Eight of the court's nine justices in 2003 in the McConnell decision that upheld the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act, BICRA, also uh, stood firmly behind disclosure. The only justice on the court who has not supported disclosure is Justice Thomas. And um, also very recently in a case out of the state of Washington called Doe v. Reed, which was not pertaining to disclosure of money in elections. It was pertaining to disclosure of the identities of those who signed petitions to get measures on ballot. Um, in that case, Doe v. Reed, eight of the court's nine justices, again, stood behind disclosure and upheld the law. And I want to read to you a very short passage from Justice Scalia's concurring opinion in that decision because it, it is perhaps the most strongly worded endorsement of disclosure that I've heard coming from a Supreme Court justice. Justice Scalia wrote, there are laws against threats and intimidation and harsh criticism short of unlawful action as a price our people have traditionally been willing to pay for self-governance. Requiring people to stand up in public for their political acts fosters civic courage without which our democracy is doomed. 
For my part, I do not look forward to a society which, thanks to the Supreme Court, campaigns anonymously and even exercises the direct democracy of initiative and referendum, hidden from public scrutiny and protected from the accountability of criticism. This does not resemble the home of the brave. So that's the backdrop here, the legal black backdrop. We have a very consistent eight judge majority, eight justice majority on our Supreme Court behind transparency and disclosure in our elections. But as Eliza explained very accurately, we have a major deficit of disclosure in this year's election. Um, why is that the case? Well, Eliza touched on the main points. One is that while indeed it is true that super PACs have to disclose all of the money coming into those super PACs, the entire universe of possible and legal donors to these PACs changed with Citizens United and Speech Now, more specifically, that came a couple months later. So for the first time in decades, it became legal for entities, for groups, for corporations to make unlimited contributions to these super PACs. What we may see at the end of this month, when most of the super PACs that have been created for this election cycle have to file their first comprehensive reports, is the filing of reports that sta state that a particular super PAC received a million dollars from Americans for Apple Pie. And because, and that is made possible by Citizens United combined with Speech Now. Prior to these cases, prior to these decisions, corporate entities like a five, say Americans for Apple Pie, hypothetical 501c4, would have been illegal for it to contribute to any federal political committee. Now they can contribute, and that's all that will have to be disclosed by a super PAC because 501c4s, as Eliza explained, themselves do not have to disclose where they get their money unless the donor is foolish enough to specifically designate their contribution to that C4 for the purpose of making electioneering ads or independent expenditures or electioneering communications. This particular deficit in disclosure, the fact that C4s only have to disclose when they make electioneering communications. They only have to disclose their donors if their donors specifically designate their money for electioneering communications. That is a creation of our very, very dysfunctional and completely gridlocked Federal Election Commission. So there are a couple players in this game that have gotten to us to this point. Um, the FEC has played a big role, and the Supreme Court, despite its promises that we will have disclosure and that will prevent corruption and that will allow voters to make informed decisions in the voting booth, and allow voters to hold corporations accountable, um, I don't think we're going to have that much information in this coming election about the true sources of money going to these super PACs, even though they nominally disclose all the money they raise and spend. Um, I just want to mention a couple of possible ways to get at this problem. Um, and before doing so, I'll also mention that there's a countervailing, um, countervailing interest here, public interest, government interest, that I, I'm confident that Alan will talk more about. It is indeed true that the Supreme Court has said over the decades in the context of these disclosure cases that if a particular donor to a political cause would suffer threats, harassment, or reprisals as a result of them being disclosed, they should be exempt from having their names disclosed. But this is a this is a exemption from disclosure that evolved in the context of the Socialist, Worker Par Socialist Workers Party, NAACP, and we're talking about extreme violence being, um, you know, these people be victims of extreme violence and often discrimination and threats and harassment and some reprisals at the hands of government itself. Um, so we'll probably hear more about that, but brief mention of some of the ways that the new Super PAC Disclosure Act that uh, the Sunlight Foundation is, has just announced last week, very similar to provisions that were in the Disclose Act that passed the House but failed a close cloture vote in the Senate in 2010. One of the ways they would get at what we might refer to as the Russian doll problem, that is to say, yes, the super PAC's disclosing, but they're getting money from another group, and we don't know how the money, who the money came from that went, in, that went into that group. In this new model, Super PAC Disclosure Act, and in the Disclose Act that narrowly failed to pass um, enactment, there were some new concepts that would have been or could be in the near future, um, if your bosses do what I'd love for them to do and pass one of these dis disclosure bills, um, embedded into the law, and that is to say, build in some presumptions that if someone gives money to the spender and either that spender solicited the money, sp specifically telling the donor that they would use it to make independent <coughs> expenditures or electionary communications, that donor should be disclosed. If there was substantial discussion between the spender and the donor, the true source of the funds, about the fact that the money would be used for election ads, that donor would be and should be disclosed. If the donor had knowledge 
that the money was going to be used by the spender for political ads, that donor should be disclosed. And finally, if the recipient of the money that's making these expenditures, if they had made substantial expenditures in the past election cycle, that would put the donor on notice that their money would likely be used, again, for expenditures, political expenditures, and that donor should be disclosed. There are some of the concepts that presently are not in our law, but are really worth taking a close look at and considering putting into our disclosure laws. And I'll stop there. Okay, well, thank you so much. And I think uh, Alan, with a slightly different perspective. I will be playing the role of the loyal opposition today. Uh, and you're right, socialist workers is one of my favorite cases. Um, I feel it sort of bears mentioning that neither a majority of the Supreme Court know the, nor those of us on the broadly defined right want a corrupt government any more than anyone else does. And I think we also don't have a particular problem with disclosure. As pointed out, eight of nine justices agree that disclosure is good for what ails you. The difference is that we think there's already so much of it. And I actually have a half page of notes on why that's the case, but thankfully my uh, co-panelists have already demonstrated that super PACs have exactly the same reporting requirements as do normal PACs which, in my view, is fairly substantial. I wasn't going to discuss C4s right off the bat, but since that's the direction this conversation is going, I'm going to briefly push back. We haven't yet seen the Russian doll problem. And you're right, it might be that at the end of this month we find out that there's hundreds of millions of dollars of C4 money just sort of swirling out there. I find that extremely unlikely for a few reasons, uh, mostly just economic. The fact of the matter is a C4 can spend money on political advocacy, but it can't be a major purpose, which means at a minimum, they can't spend more than 50% of what they're actually taking in on ads and donations to PACs and things of that nature. So anyone who wants an anonymity badly enough to take a 50% cut right off the top of their contribution, um, I just don't see that happening. Second of all, any of that money that is then spent actually is taxed. So generally the money that goes is you know, handled by a C4 is non-taxable income. The contribution might be under a gift tax, but that's a separate question. But the actual, if you're spending you know, 49%, let's take the worst case scenario, of your C4 donations as you know, political advocacy money, all of that is taxable. And again, that's, that's another haircut that's coming off of the top of your contribution. So it's, it's an extraordinarily inefficient way of influencing politics, is that what you're trying to do? Um, I should also point out that a lot of the C4s, I mean, I think people think of C4s in the current debate as, you know, these are shadow organizations like Americans for Apple Pie who are terrible, terrible people, let me tell you. Um, but it's, it's a lot of groups. It's the NRA, it's the Sierra Club, it's most of the people you would think of as major advocacy organizations are C4s. And they're obviously interested in participating in politics. But I think you have to keep in mind that a couple things. One, a lot of the people who are C4s you've heard of don't make you know, fortunes off of billionaire contributions. They take in large amounts of small donations from large numbers of people and they reflect a reasonable sort of grassroots approach to particular issues. So I think painting C4s as the enemy in this year's election is a mistake. Um, I'm, I may be proved wrong, as I've said, because there is so much disclosure. But uh, sitting here today, I think it's very unlikely that we're going to see all this um, funneling of money through C4s. So that's my spiel on that. There are four separate people to rebut me. Uh, so let me just give you sort of my overall view of how disclosure should work. And I think that this is a lot of what the Supreme Court had in mind. Um, I, I tend to take issue with the idea that the Supreme Court, you know, said, here's our ruling on a major First Amendment case, but we don't really know what we're talking about about disclosure. I mean, Citizens United had amicus briefs from just about everybody and their mother. I think roughly a tenth of American lawyers were engaged in some way in this case. It was ridiculous. Um, I don't think the Supreme Court was uninformed when it was talking about disclosure in that case. And they didn't suggest particular um, changes. They didn't suggest that future cases would turn on those sorts of enactments. And I'm not sure that necessarily impacts the constitutionality of any sort of legislation. I would tend to think, and I'm sure you all would agree with me, that most of the disclosed sort of um, suggestions that have been brought to Congress would probably pass constitutional muster. That doesn't make them a good idea. And I don't think we should read the Supreme Court's opinion as saying, you know what you guys really need to do is pass a new law on disclosure. I read the case as basically saying there is a lot of disclosure out there and that's the way that a democracy deals with First Amendment problems. So an alternative view. In my view, it's a question of who should be disclosing the, the contributions. And in my view, that, that should be the person who's actually controlling their content. This idea that you know, whoever at any point during an entire chain of funding might have given a dollar 
uh, I think is, is, is dangerous. I mean, a lot of people will say, well, look, the Chamber of Commerce spent, what was it, $30 million in the 2010 election, and we want to know precisely who their membership was and who, you know, gave them that money. Well, if you're going to go that direction, I think you have to be consistent. You have to say, you know, the NRA also spent money. We should get their membership list. And I think that that, that sort of approach would pose grave constitutional problems. And I think that it would, well, I would look forward to litigating it against anyone at this table. Um, as far as what should be disclosed, I think this is, again, a, a related issue. A colleague of mine, I thought, had a very good idea on this, which is to take the Daubert standard of evidence in federal courts and use that as sort of a starting point. What, what that says broadly, and trust me, you don't want to get into the details, is that information may be brought in as expert testimony if it is in some way enlightening to the jury. And I think that's a reasonable standard here. I think there is a real danger of junk disclosure where we're giving out all sorts of information that's just clogging up the tubes, which no one is ever going to look up, which isn't relevant to anyone's vote, and which is just a burden on the people who have to do the disclosing. Uh, for instance, right now, the PAC slash super PAC disclosure limit is $200. I simply don't understand how $200 can be, considered, can, can be considered a corrupting amount of money given the scale of politics in this country. And I'm not sure who has ever benefited from being able to look up the name and address and employer of someone who gave $200. Um, I think that is just frankly junk that's out there in the, in the world and people can look it up, but it doesn't actually move anything. It doesn't change any votes. It's, it's not relevant to any of these sort of standards the Supreme Court has put out there. As for when, this is the toughest one, in, in my view, for, for my side. And that's the, you know, I, I do see the point to, you know, we have an election in, in Iowa, and we're not going to know who's funding these ads until after the, after the primary or after the straw poll or after whatever. That's a fair point. Um, I wonder how many people who, who say we need to, you know, have by the minute disclosure have ever actually worked for a political committee or a political campaign. I mean, I'm in a room full of politician types. Who here's actually worked on a campaign? How many of you did the FEC sort of filing work? Okay, none of you. That's not helpful for me. Um, no, but I mean, it, it really is an extremely difficult and burdensome process. And I think that a reason, the reasonableness of a 24 or 48 hour window, which is what we do on independent expenditures in this country, is, is manifest. And I'm not entirely clear on how you would go about getting around the problem that people are going to spend money or take in money the day before the election um, and then turn around in five minutes and post it online. It just, that doesn't strike me as the way you run a business or an organization. Um, and similarly, and, and I think this is almost as important, you know, you're not only disclosing your donors, you're also disclosing you know, your spending. And you disclose your spending at the moment it becomes an obligation. So if you buy an ad and the ad is going to air the day before the election, you disclose it the day you bought it. You don't disclose it the day before the election. The likelihood is that's going to end up on a report. And if someone happens to give money to your organization the day before the election, well, you know, that money didn't go for the ad that was being, you know, aired that day. That money was already, that's going to go into another election. It's going to be a continuing forward sort of fund. So I think in practice, that's less of a concern than people think it is. I think more of that spending gets picked up than, you know, sort of the rhetoric would lead you to believe. Um, but I'm, I'm sure we'll discuss that in some detail. And finally, the question of you know, where you disclose. Uh, I am all for online disclosure. Uh, I think not having searchable databases and you know, having these, these terrible PDFs is horrid. And there's no excuse for that, uh, given the size of our economy and the amount we spend on all sorts of other ridiculous things. So I, I definitely think that that is common ground. Um, where we're probably not going to agree, and this actually came up in the Disclose Act, and I believe is also in the bill that uh, is currently being considered by the Sunlight Foundation, is the idea of the disclaimer that you actually put into the advertisement itself. I mean, everyone's used to these stand by your ad sort of languages where, you know, I'm Alan Dickerson and I'm running for dog catcher of DC, um, and I approve this message. You know, maybe that has a certain role. I think in the, in the area of independent expenditures, it's less helpful. Um, that's for a few reasons. One is saying, you know, I'm the candidate and I approve this whatever, that has some content. Saying I'm, you know, Crossroads GPS and I approve of this doesn't tell anyone anything, which is why there's always the next step, which is, okay, fine, so it doesn't tell you anything, so you include that. And this is an actual example from Massachusetts. Uh, here's the organization who approved it. I'm the general counsel or chief executive officer or president or whatever, and this is my name, and I, I approved it, and here are our top five donors. Now, 
I don't know how you're supposed to fit that into a 15 second radio ad or a 30 second TV spot or anything else. I mean, either you get the Micro Machines guy to show up and sort of, you know, say it really fast, or, you know, none of that information is actually conveyed. What you're doing is you're just taking half of your airtime that you've paid for that is a protected First Amendment activity and taking it right off the top because you're going to put in all this information that's probably not going to change a single person's vote in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And, I mean, I very much look forward to the constitutional challenge to that, both there and in a lot of other localities. And the idea of that making, making that the federal standard, I think, would, well, it would do two things. One, it would immediately make this into a case before the D.C. Circuit, which I think we'd win. And two, it would really tie up a lot of people's hard-earned money. So I'm sure, I actually have an entire page of comments on all of your stuff, but I'll wait. Great. Well, thank you so much. Uh, so, I mean, all four of you have raised really interesting uh, and important issues, and, and we'll play through them as much as we can. And, of course, we'll get questions from the audience in a bit as well. But first, I want to sort of pick up on one thing that, that Alan uh, was saying, which is with the information that is not being disclosed, does anybody look at it? Is it valuable? Uh, is it just a burden? At least from, uh, I think I'd like to actually start with Eliza from a reporter's perspective. Because um, yeah. presumably you're trolling through all of this information, uh, looking for stories. You know, would it be useful to have more? What? Please talk. A little bit. Uh, yeah, I probably spend a lot more time than I should looking through campaign finance documents. Uh, I do want to acknowledge Alan's point about nonprofits, and it would be wrong to say that. Um, at least I think nonprofits are the enemy. I think it's simply a statement of fact that there isn't disclosure around nonprofits. So Absolutely. if we talk about disclosure, we have to acknowledge that. Uh, and I also think Alan has touched on a very important point here, which is that when you go into requiring disclosure from nonprofits, you're in a difficult and controversial area. And you know there may be an argument that what we really need to do is get the IRS to be a little more aggressive about saying to nonprofits, you know, if you spend all of your money on campaigns, you're really not a tax-exempt group anymore. Um, so just to go to the question of disclosure and why it's useful to people like me, I really don't think that it is junk disclosure. You'd be amazed how useful it is uh, to be able to look at these reports to see who the treasurer is, to call the treasurer. You can call the donors. Um, even at that, you know, the disclosure that's there is not that comprehensive. A lot of times the place of employment isn't listed. Either are an amazing number of campaign finance reports that have zero, 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 zero. It's like they filed the report, but there's no money in there. And then there's a letter also in the public record from the FEC saying, we request more information. So <laughs> there's an amazing amount of kind of junk disclosure in the sense that it's not actual disclosure. But I think in the Internet age, I, I really am a little hard-pressed to see why it is so hard. And, and what I would say from a legislative point of view, and, and I want to state quite clearly that it's not roll call's job to endorse legislation, it's just to report upon it, so we're not here to take a position. But it, to the extent that I have any kind of argument on the legislative front is, if it isn't broken, don't try to fix it. Don't try to fix what's not, what's not broken. And what I think is not broken is the current disclosure regime, actually, for political action committees. You know, we're sitting here talking about all these people who knock themselves out to avoid disclosure, and there are always going to be people like that out there. But there's an amazing number of players who really want to just play by the rules. Their whole thing is, just tell me what the rules are and let me follow them. And so if you are going to write legislation, I think there's a strong argument for keeping it pretty simple. And I think that one of the reasons last year's Disclose Act ran into trouble was it was a pretty complicated bill. So keep it simple and provide a simple vehicle for people who don't feel like using nonprofits or super PACs or any other new kind of vehicle and who just want to spend campaign money the old-fashioned way through political action committees. That's one thing I would not get rid of, and I don't think that's junk disclosure. You know, and I think uh, an additional point is, you know, one question that was raised was what's going on, a little, at least alluded to, was what's going on at the state level. Mm -hmm. And that might be maybe something that you can talk to a little bit in terms of how different states deal with these disclosure questions. Sure. I mean, that's actually an incredibly hard question to answer because the states are all over the map. Uh, and, and to tell you the truth, it can be wildly difficult. I mean, and I'm sitting as an attorney um, who fields calls from uh, state advocates around the country and from state lawmakers asking questions about policy. I, and, and for me, it is extremely complicated actually to um, get through the various web of laws in all of the different states 
And I understand that it is extremely complicated for groups that are on the ground and trying to comply. And um, I guess I'll say three main trends, though, that we're seeing, and then one recommendation. Mm -hmm. Trends, um, many, many, many states, I think, found themselves flat-footed after Citizens United. And n not everywhere, but there, there has been a perception, at least among many state lawmakers, that the rules of the game were changed. There's a lot more money coming in in new ways, and their disclosure regime is not equipped for it at all. And some of that is a correct perception that Citizens United did change the rules. Some of it is actually just, I, I think, evolutions in, in political campaigning is kind of a natural course. But regardless, there has been, um, I think a, there is a sense of urgency, certainly, in many states to enact um, new disclosure regimes and strengthen existing laws. There's also been a push in a lot of places to bring things online, which I, I can agree with everybody at the table that that is a, a great goal. And um, I mean, in, you know, it, in the situation of campaign finance and in voting in many, many other areas of law, automating processes, getting things online, actually tends to be most efficient, most cost of saving, and there's all sorts of benefits. Um, a recommendation, though, and this gets to Eliza's point, is, you know, I, I struggle a lot with lawmakers at the state level who have these campaign finance disclosure bills that are, quite frankly, extremely complicated. And usually they are cobbled together, it's some existing state law and some federal law and some law from a neighboring state. And it's difficult to know what to do about that because I understand that many of these people are working with very thin staffs and they're not experts in the field. And then there are a lot of barriers. But I do completely agree with what many people have said, that one of the best things that you can do as a policymaker is think about ways to achieve your policy goal that are straightforward, that have clear-cut rules, that are easy for everybody to understand, and that also have some sort of robust enforcement mechanism, which is something that people tend to overlook. So I, I'd like to, to ask the two gentlemen, actually. Um, so one of the, the issues that has been raised at least a couple of times, uh, particularly in the opening remarks, had to do with coordination and with um, uh, the appearance or actuality of corruption. Uh, election law expert Rick Hazen was quoted as saying, the greatest danger of super PACs is that they may skew the legislative process in the next Congress in favor of the interests of large super PAC contributors. Uh, he essentially was arguing that the independent spending can corrupt because the large contributions create either the actuality or the appearance of of corruption that they may feel indebted to the people who are making the donations. And at the same time, we see from the super PAC side that many of them are being run by close associates of current candidates. Uh, for example, I'll give two examples just to be uh, even handed. One is that there's a major super PAC affiliated with Mitt Romney that's run by three of his former aides from the 2008 campaign. And looking at uh, Mr. Gingrich, uh, his former spokesman, Rick Tyler, uh, is helping to run it, and he said, quote, we're Newt, we're Newt Super PAC. We take our marching orders through the media for Newt Gingrich. I do what Newt tells me through the media, and it's all within the confines of the law. Uh, this certainly, you know, from, from a, you know, on its face, looks like we have coordination going on. Uh, there's information going back and forth about who's giving money to whom. It seems like they're, they're you know, certainly creates the appearance of a quid pro quo, and I was hoping that you guys could could address that, whether the coordination rules are real, whether the either corruption or appearance of corruption is real, and uh, if the answer to those questions are, are yes, you know, what is the appropriate response? And Alan, would you like to take the first swing at that? Um, sure. If you go back and, and read Citizens United, which, you know, is a good thing to do if you've got about 12 extra hours on your hands, um, one of the things the court is really concerned about is this fact that you need a bright line rule. Because if you don't have a bright line rule, if you don't say these people get to speak and these people don't, or these people get to use this type of vehicle or these people don't, two things happen. One is that everyone goes around being scared to death of a federal investigation where they have to hire one of us at an unreasonable amount of money and, you know, have to fight it. <laughs> you can speak for yourself on that. Well, I also work for a nonprofit, <laughs> but, um, you know, and, and this sort of, don't worry, I'm pro bono. <laughs> I know. But the, um, a lawyer at an unreasonable amount of money. 
and, and you know, have to worry about these, these very you know, fact-intensive inquiries. And this isn't a question of you know, a nice binary thing where you know, right now the rule is, you know, did you contribute to a super PAC? Did that super PAC take out an independent expenditure? If the answer to those two questions is yes, which is relatively straightforward under the current law, at least in my view, that's it. You're done. The feds pack up and go home. If the standard is something like, well, how close is too close to the candidate? Is Huntsman's father too close? Is, you know, Gingrich's former campaign manager too close? Is Obama's former treasury secretary too close? I mean, where exactly is the line? At that point, you're not having a nice quick, you know, in and out with the feds. They're coming in, they're taking all of your emails, they're interviewing all of your associates, they're subpoenaing all sorts of documents, and $7 million in legal fees later, it turns out you didn't actually break the law. That chills an enormous amount of speech. And that's something that, that the Citizens United majority was really worried about. So, I mean, I guess part of what I'm saying is that I don't know because there's a, there's a nice bright line under current law that says as long as it's not coordinated, and coordinated we mean as a term of art, meaning that in advance of the actual spending of money, you didn't discuss X and Y, well then, you know, you're fine. Well, let me press you on that a little sure. bit. So there was a recent Supreme Court decision in Blumen versus FEC which upheld the government's power to bar political contributions to parties, PACs, and others from non-resident aliens. And uh, Brad Smith said that the decision is essentially, that decision was essentially fine, that you know you can distinguish between people who are domestic and people who are foreign, but then you have foreign-owned corporations or corporations that own parts of domestic corporations. And this, this bright line rule that you're talking about as being really helpful sort of gets smeared all over the table. So, you know, it, it, as you discuss it, is it really a question that sort of, you know, maybe Congress should be dealing with where they say, and the bright line rule is, this is where it is and no further, and they make that kind of a determination as opposed to saying, well, you know, maybe this is too much, maybe this is enough, maybe this is too close, not close enough. You know, that's why you have a regulatory process, right, to try to make those decisions in the first place so people know what they're supposed to do. I don't disagree at all. That's one of the reasons I think the FEC's rulemaking is so broken. But, I mean, in, in, when you're specifically talking about corporations, um, I mean, the Blumen CCP debate is a really interesting one, and probably 10 people are going to get tenure on it. But it's, I, I do see a difference. I, I, I agree with Brad, and not merely because I work for him. Um, but, you know, there is this, this idea that, and it's in Citizens United. Everyone points to Citizens United and says, look, one of the big interests is that American citizens have a right to be informed by the, the broad range of views, including, you know, the corporations, which are a big part of the economy and employ a lot of us. Um, you know, but, and a lot of people say, well, fine, but what's the difference, you know, if, if the right is held by the American people as voters, then why isn't it that, why shouldn't they be interested in the opinions of the Chinese government? Well, it's because they take the quote out of context. What CCP actually says, not CCP, what CU actually says is that, um, you know, you have a right to have the views of the community heard, you know, that you have a right to hear from everyone else who re resides within the community. That's the language they use. And I mean, this is a very old, you know, not to quote a Frenchman, is a very Tocquevillian idea, you know, where we all just sit there and talk amongst ourselves and people aren't silenced and we, we come to opinions as a community. So in that sense, I don't, I don't find the concept weird that we don't, we're excluding the views of the Chinese government or the Russian government or Saudi princes, to use an example that's been raised several times with me. Now, onto your point about corporate governance. Um, that's tricky. Uh, but all issues about corporate governance are tricky. I mean, it's not that, you know, this idea of how much of a, cor is a corporation or a subsidiary controlled from abroad is not a new question in corporate law. We do this all the time for whether or not you have to, you know, file with the SEC. We do it for tax purposes. We do it for customs purposes. We do it for, you know, whether or not your IP address falls under the jurisdiction of a particular federal agency. I mean, these are questions which very, very smart people who generally make more than election lawyers have been fighting over for decades. And I think if you went to any reputable law firm and said, look, we really need to know whether or not we're controlled from abroad, you're going to get a pretty solid answer. So I, I take your point, certainly, on we need a bright line rule, but what about this? But I think at that point you're not asking a question about election law, you're asking a question about corporate law. And I think there's an answer in corporate law. All right, so Paul, do you want to go at this as well? Yeah, you know, one of the things that I have found to be infinitely frustrating since the birth of the super PACs is misreporting, consistent and persistent misreporting in the press of some notion that creating the impression that super PACs have to be independent from candidates. The law doesn't require that. Alan alluded to this in his remarks. Um, there is no law that says super PACs have to be independent of candidates. There are some restrictions that say, for example, super PACs cannot coordinate discrete specific expenditures with candidates. And 
that rule is, in my view, uh, riddled with some pretty sizable holes. And there's another area of federal law that says super PACs cannot solicit unlimited contributions. I I'm sorry, candidates cannot solicit unlimited contributions from super PACs. Um, and for reasons I'll get into in a second, also a very, very weak and modest provision. But they're the only two provisions that I know of in federal law that constrain the relationship between super PACs and candidates. They can't coordinate on specific expenditures, as that term's defined pretty weakly in law, and they cannot solicit unlimited contributions under a rule that's pretty weak. So why is the solicitation rule weak? Well, it's weak because the Federal Election Commission ruled in an advisory opinion last year that a candidate attending and speaking and being a featured guest at a super PAC fundraising event does not itself constitute a solicitation. It's perfectly legal. And in fact, we have, for example, seen Mitt Romney showing up at the fundraising events for Restore Our Future. So you have this notion built in, baked into the Citizens United decision. Don't worry, America, this money will be spent independently of candidates, so it can't corrupt those candidates. And then you have Mitt Romney appearing at the fundraising events and is of a super PAC that's raising million dollar contributions or larger, um, and making comments to the press that he perceives those contributions as being made to him, um, which is another anecdote that gets to the the notion that we don't have a Russian doll problem yet. But, so, but before I tell you that very brief anecdote, I want to talk about the coordination rules for a second. So the solicitation rules, the ban on uh, candidate solicitation of unlimited contributions for super PACs is weak because they can still go to the fundraisers. The coordination rules are weak because, for example, um, while there is a blackout period of 120 days for a former employee of a candidate who goes to work for a super PAC from being involved in that super PAC's uh, creation of independent expenditures, that provision of the law does not apply if or unless that individual conveys to the super PAC information that is material to the creation of the specific ads, and that information is not obtained from a publicly available source like the candidate's website. So in, at some degree, to some degree there's a revolving door provision, but it's very modest in its application. Alan made a remark that we don't have a Russian doll problem yet, and this ties directly into some comments Romney has made to the press about a million dollar donor from one of his friends. There were very few super PACs in existence in the 2012 cycle when the last comprehensive reports were due to be filed at the FEC on July 31st of 2011, but Restore Our Future was one of them. And what did journalists find when they began combing through those reports? Three separate $1 million contributions from corporations that no one had ever heard of, so they started doing a little digging. One of those corporations was called WSPAWN LLC. It had been created last spring. It made a million dollar contribution to re Restore Our Future in the spring, and then it was dissolved in July before the report was even filed. So the reporter dug in a little bit, found out that it was associated, well, actually the reporter couldn't find any information really other than a Manhattan address that was shared with the same building at the Bain Capital Office was in. We filed a, a complaint with the Federal Election Commission early August on a Friday afternoon saying, we don't really know what's going on here, but this looks shady and it looks like it may violate another provision of federal law that prohibits making a contribution in the name of another. And what we um, speculated was that there was a human out there, probably several humans, behind this corporate shell, and they made a million dollar contribution in the name of this corporate shell. Classic Russian doll problem may or may not be prosecuted as a violation of the law. Um, the FEC has a very, very weak track record of enforcing federal law, as does the Justice Department when it comes to campaign finance laws. And anyway, so we filed a complaint on Friday afternoon, and I wake up on Saturday morning, and sometime either Friday night or Saturday morning, a human being named Ed Kennard came forward and said, oh, oh, sorry, that was me, that was me. And a day, I believe it was the next day that Mitt Romney was on the campaign trail, and he was asked about this, and he said, oh, no harm, no foul. He's an old friend of mine. He gave me a million dollars. No problem. Moving on. Well, he hadn't given a million dollars to Mitt Romney. He had given a million dollars to Restore Our Future. And he hadn't given it publicly in his own name. He had given it through a shell company that he set up. Um, that's a Russian doll problem, and it's an even bigger Russian doll problem if the FEC doesn't crack down on that type of money laundering through corporate entities. But So that demonstrates, A, there is a Russian doll problem in my view, but B, these candidates who are supposed to be living and existing independently of these super PACs perceive these super PACs as being their own pots of money. Mitt Romney, oh, he gave me a million bucks. No harm, no foul. That's a big problem. That poses just as much of a threat of corruption to our democracy as if it were legal for not only Ed Kennard, but an, an actual business corporation to cut a million dollar check directly to 
an individual who may be the next president of this country. Would you Can yes, please. follow up? Mm -hmm. I, I just wanted to um, dovetail on that to stress this, to go back to something Alan said about the C4s. It is undoubtedly true that C4s are not the enemy and that there are, are many, many fabulous 501C4s, you know, every, everything from the NRA to Planned Parenthood, you know, pick your favorite. And, and many of them are indeed funded by lots of small donations. That's not necessarily the problem, and I don't think that many of us at this table would claim that to be the problem. The bigger problem um, is when C4s are used as to, to shield these corporate entities or, or other rich individuals, and I think the Chamber of Commerce, um, a group that Alan brought up, which is actually a 501c6, that similar rules is a huge problem because they spend a huge amount to influence elections. And we understand, we the community understand that they represent quote unquote business interests, but we have no way to know in any given circumstance if they're getting you know a $5 million donation from Walmart to target a very small election to blow out of the water some person who is against changing the zoning laws to allow Walmart in. That is a huge problem, as is the problem. No, I mean, it, but, 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 I mean, that goes back to, I mean, it's only earmarked if you're stupid enough to say that it's earmarked. There's lots of ways to convey. I, I mean, you know, we're all human beings. You guys understand that you can convey what you want someone to do with something without actually running afoul of the legal rules. And then there's also this problem that Paul brought up with people using these C4s as pure sham shell organizations. And, and, and you know, that is, I think that's a more of an enforcement problem. But unfortunately, we haven't seen any enforcement from the FEC, from the IRS, or from the Justice Department. I can't think of another entity <laughs> that would have jurisdiction. But it, the result is there is a very real ability to create a 501c4 organization for the very purpose of funneling money to a super PAC or other sort of political entity, dissolve it, and, you know, the American people, I mean, we don't really know what hit us. So I just wanted to underscore that. Yeah, I just will say very briefly about 501c4 groups or any other kind of nonprofit. Absolutely, Mimi is quite right. The vast majority of these groups are the kind of salt of the earth groups that you guys might contribute money to. And I think, again, this is one of the reasons why it's very, very challenging to regulate in this area. But I do think that it's worth saying that the IRS has a reputation for not having the necessary resources right. to make sure that nonprofit groups actually are serving a purpose that's around social welfare as opposed to campaigns. And I think to say, you know, I, I don't really think we're going to have abuses by nonprofits in this area. That seems a little naive to me, I'm sorry. You know, if you look at groups like Swift Boat Veterans for Truth, very, very influential in the 2004 election, when that group first hit the airwaves, nobody knew what they were about. Yeah, groups like, um, you know, watchdog organizations and organizations like the New York Times dug around and found that information, but especially at a time when we have an economic downturn and a news industry that's going through great change and tightening its belt on all fronts, I don't think we can really count on investigative reporters like Woodward and Bernstein to go out and get the story the way they did in the Watergate era. You know, I'd love to make just one more point about these C4s because Alan alluded to this 50% uh, reduction in efficiency, I think it was to paraphrase you, but if you give money to a C4, you're really cutting your efficiency to influence an election in half because C4s cannot have as their primary activity getting involved in elections. Um, I don't agree that you're cutting your efficiency in half. I do agree that there is an IRS rule saying that election, candidate election influencing cannot be the primary activity of a C4. How do C4s get around this? Well, go to the website of Crossroads GPS. This is a group that was set up by Karl Rove, and this is going on, on both sides of the political aisle. There are Democratic and Republican groups. Karl Rove set up American Crossroads as a super PAC, Crossroads GPS as a C4. He said very openly to the press and to his donors, if you are willing to be disclosed, give to my super PAC because as I think we're all pretty much in agreement here, if an individual is giving money to a super PAC, they're going to get disclosed. If you don't want to be disclosed, make your check out to my C4, Crossroads GPS. So is it a really a 50% reduction in effectiveness, however, when Crossroads GPS is running 
using 49% of their budget to run ads that say vote for candidate X or vote against candidate Y, and they spend the other 51% of their budget running ads saying candidate X is going to raise your taxes, candidate X wants to tax you into your grave, call candidate X and tell them what you think. They're running issue ads in very close proximity to elections in battleground states using broadcast media. It certainly appears as though their principal goal is to affect elections, even with the 51% of their money that they're spending on so-called issue ads, particularly when you look at their battleground state targeting. Um, but they have very good lawyers. They know what the IRS's rules are. They know the IRS's weak track record of enforcement. And they know how to write some sham, hard-hitting issue ads. So just go to Crossroads GPS website, check out their ads that they would, their lawyers would say, these are issue ads, these aren't candidate ads. And ask yourself, is this really a major 50% reduction in efficiency of electoral influencing dollars? I don't think so. You look like you're about to burst out of your chair. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, usually you get to reserve time for rebuttal in court. Um, so where to start? I take your point on issue ads. Of course, everyone at this table and probably many people here know that there's been a long, long debate about what exactly an issue ad is. And we're back to the bright line problem. I mean, yes, I mean, people can definitely look at this stuff and say, you know, this sure looks like an electoral communication. It sure looks like, you know, the, the functional equivalent of express advocacy or any of these other, you know, phrases that the Supreme Court has come up with. But you have to understand why they have those phrases because it's, again, it's back to the bright lines issue. Like, you, you have to be able to differentiate between, you know, well, maybe you don't, which is an entire different question. But if you're going to regulate campaign speech differently from other types of First Amendment speech, you have to be able to distinguish between the NRA saying, you know, my God, we need our gun rights, or Sierra Club saying, please don't put in this landfill, and, you know, vote to defeat Senator so-and-so. And every single time the court has tried to do this over the last 30 years, they've ended up in this enormous morass because, yes, people are smart. And the nice thing about rat lane rules is you don't get to be quite as smart with them. And as a result, we have jurisprudence that says, you know, this is an electoral communication and this isn't. I, mean, I understand that people may not be comfortable with that, but it's, we're a nation of laws and there has to be some amount of predictability. And I mean, this is where I really think the Supreme Court gets more flack than maybe they deserve. This is a tough question. And they had to draw the line somewhere, and they drew the line in a way that protects the maximum amount of speech. And I mean, depending on your views on the First Amendment, that's laudable. Um, but but I, don't, I don't think it's fair to call it a sham issue ad, which incidentally is a phrase that's been overturned. But Well, you know, the, the Congress did address this problem, the bright line problem, in the McCain-Feingold law with the electioneering and communications definition. It was precisely tailored to the, get at this issue, and it said, if you're going to run a broadcast cable or satellite ad within 30 days of a primary or 60 days of a general, targeted to the relevant electorate and spend more than 10 grand, you have to file a disclosure report saying that you spent the money. Well, the C4s are filing that report saying they spent X dollars on X day, but what Congress also said in that statute, the Bi Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act, the McCain-Feingold Law, was that anyone who spends, including an organization, a C4, that spends more than $10,000 on that type of ad, bright line ad, easy to know whether you're inside or outside of that line, um, has to disclose all contributors who contributed more than $1,000 to that organization. And it is the FEC, after that law was held up by eight justices of the Supreme Court, it's the FEC that passed a regulation with very little notice in 2007 saying the only time you, C4, or other spender actually has to tell us where you got your money, we're not going to make you require the names of all contributors who contributed $1,000 or more. We're only going to make you con disclose the names of a contributor who gave you $1,000 or more for the purpose of furthering that specific ad who gave you that money specifically designated for running that ad. It's the FEC that gutted a statute passed by Congress. But I think Congress effectively dealt with the bright line issue. So on, on that, I've got, unless you guys want to jump in, I've got one more question. And then we're going to open up questions from the audience as well. So be thinking. Uh, uh, if there's something that you'd like us to address. I mean, there's certainly everything from the, the price of anonymity, which could be 50% or, or, or nothing, questions around the NAACP versus Alabama case, which is mm -hmm. the one which had to do with um, why associations are particularly protected uh, in terms of having to disclose their membership. It has to do with Ku Klux Klan and, and the lack of safety in the South uh, or the Russian doll question. So, but the one that, that I'd like to ask of the folks up here which is that there's been a number of, there's a number of different attempts and different venues by which people are trying to address these issues. We've heard a bit about the FEC, we've heard a little bit about the Disclose Act. Uh, the FCC has a piece of this as well. The SEC, I mean, we have alphabet soup going on here. Um, are any of, 
you know, if anyone has like a, an effort to deal with this, either they'd like to condemn or to, to praise, that's worth bringing to the attention of the folks here. Maybe I'll just start and go straight across. So. Sure. Um, I'll just highlight one effort that I don't think has been raised yet, and that is the SEC, <laughs> the Securities and Exchange Commission. There has been um, um, a petition and much talk of a new rule that would require um, publicly um, owned companies to disclose their the, the money that they spend on political advertising, and this would have to be disclosed to the SEC as a public record. And then it would also, um, you know, there's kind of variations of it. But one variation, it would just have to be disclosed to the shareholders. One variation, you could actually uh, tell these companies that they had to get shareholders. You know, obviously the shareholders are the owners of the company. Under one variation, the shareholders would have to give approval to the corporation before it'd be able to spend money in that manner. So that's something else to keep your eye on. Well, there's really only one bill that I'm willing to say, or proposal, legislative proposal, that I'm willing to say that I like right now. And that's the one that has to do with the Federal Communications Commission, because the FCC already, to some degree, tells us what's being spent. Mm -hmm. And that is a great way for reporters such as myself to know what's being spent, and it's one of the reasons why we can say 30 plus million dollars has been spent by super PACs, because there are groups like CMAG, Cantar Media, that track the spending. And that's a pretty simple and not very, I think, intrusive way to just say, look, here are the number of ads that were bought, and here's who bought them. That would be pretty easy, and I think it would be pretty illustrative and helpful just in getting a grip on what's being spent and by whom. Um, I'm going to be provocative, and I'm going to say that I actually think that this is such a difficult area to legislate in for constitutional and free speech reasons that I advocate um, a correction via a culture change. I think that nonprofit organizations should voluntarily disclose their donors, and I think there should be growing public pressure on groups to voluntarily disclose their donors, and I think groups that don't disclose should be embarrassed and that that is the only way that we're really ever going to fully correct this problem. I do want to say that to the degree that disclosure rules are challenging or perceived to be impossible or ineffective or junk disclosure, there is a surprising model out there, which is the lobbying disclosure laws. Mm -hmm. A lot of people say those are incomplete and not enough lobbyists are captured, and a lot of lobbyists say they're a mess and they need to be fixed. But interestingly enough, they don't seem to be that burdensome to lobbyists. They're very illustrative. They've shed a lot of light on the industry. Uh, there has been a remarkable amount of self-correction within the lobbying industry, due in part to the Jack Abramoff scandal, which, by the way, I don't think would have come to light without the lobbying disclosure laws that we have in place. So I just really think simple, basic disclosure laws that require reporting in a way that's not hard to understand, that draws bright lines, and that doesn't burden people unnecessarily, Again, if it's not broken, don't fix it. Those things work for PACs and for lobbyists. Let's keep that model, let's not mess it up, and maybe expand it a little. And you know, if we want to give the IRS a little extra money to kind of decide who's really a nonprofit, that probably wouldn't hurt either. Before we go to Paul, I have to say three things. One, because our communications director will beat me if I don't, um, which is, of course, the Sunlight Foundation has its own uh, draft uh, lobbying, uh, excuse me, lobbying disclosure. I work on lobbying disclosure as well. It has its own uh, draft uh, disclosure rules for super PACs called the Super PAC Act, which is open for public comment at publicmarkup.org. The second is that we, the Advisory Committee on Transparency, held an event last year on lobbying reform. Uh, it's worth looking at. Uh, you can watch the video at transparencycaucus.org. And the third is that the Sunlight Foundation discloses all of its, con uh, all of its contributions and also our expenditures to other entities that we fund, they're all available at sunlightfoundation.com. It's certainly something that we encourage other organizations to do, although I'm not going to put anybody on the spot uh, about that at this table. Um, but um, whether you look at lobbying disclosure or whether you look at um, uh, disclosure of super PACs or other things along those lines, um, you know, there are a lot of holes in the way the rules are formulated that are definitely worth looking uh, more deeply into. So, and with that, Paul. Um, 
You know, in terms of legislation, I think there's some really good content in the Super PAC Act that Daniel just mentioned. Um, it's quite similar in some respects to the Disclose Act, but it's very much so stripped down with a lot without many of the bells and whistles that got hung on to the Disclose Act. I would love to see some legislation introduced this year that is a much, much more streamlined uh, version of the Disclose Act without a lot of the bells and whistles. Um, the FEC is really what I spend most of my professional time uh, monitoring and, and participating or engaging with. I don't have a lot of hope for the Federal Election Commission. The Federal Election Commission three times in 2011 deadlocked 3-3 on a uh, document that would begin a rulemaking to undo the loophole that the Commission itself created in 2007 that I was dis explaining a couple minutes ago, the one that says, no, you don't have to disclose all your contributors, you only have to disclose the ones who give you the money for the purpose of furthering the ad. Three times in 2011, they deadlocked 3-3 three, three on party lines. You have three Democratic commissioners, who, one of whom was there in 2007, voted for the rule in 2007 and very much so regrets her vote, and two colleagues saying, yes, let's at least open this up for public comment and revisiting it three Democrat commissioners who have voted against doing so three times in 2011, and five of our current six federal election commissioners are serving in expired terms. Five of them could be replaced by the president whenever he wants to, and he has completely failed, I think, on this front. He has failed to exercise the initiative necessary to overhaul the FEC and turn it back into a functioning federal campaign finance regulatory agency. One other hope on this FEC front is a lawsuit that the Campaign Legal Center is involved in. We're part of the legal team representing Representative Van Hollen, uh, who has sued the Federal Election Commission precisely about this rule passed in 2007. There were oral arguments about two weeks ago in Federal District Court. Uh, we're waiting and seeing, and hopefully the best case scenario, which unfortunately isn't a super strong posture, but the best case scenario is that the court orders the Federal Election Commission to revisit this rule, to conduct a rulemaking, to consider once again whether this loophole created in 07 was a good thing. Um, so we have our fingers crossed, hoping we get a good decision in the Van Hollen case, but that's all we've got. Well, I'll start with the things where I actually agree with the rest of the panel. Um, I, I completely agree with you on a culture shift. I mean, I, I think a lot of us um, on my side of the spectrum um, don't have a problem with disclosure as long as it's voluntary. Our fear is, you know, back to the whole federal investigations and $7 million in fees. Um, and to the extent that any group that finds itself uh, so blessedly uncontroversial that it can do that, um, sure. Um, but obviously, I mean, that's the First Amendment is, too, is for the other groups. Um, and I also agree with you that I don't have a lot of hope for the FEC, um, and we're going to now encapsulate the problem at the FEC for you. Um, go to the website and look up, you know, super PAC forms. There aren't any, I'm, unless I'm wrong. I mean, and I've looked, you know, there is not a single FEC regulation that, that notices the fact that super PACs exist because the FEC hasn't been able to get together and write up a nice short two paragraph regulation that says, oh, by the way, we noticed that the Supreme Court of the United States and a federal district court sitting in the District of Columbia said certain things about the Constitution. That's nowhere there. There's no form. What you do is you take a regular PAC form, and Stephen Colbert did this brilliantly. <laughs> you take a regular PAC form, you fill it out, and then you write up a nice little letter on your letterhead that says, oh, by the way, we're actually a super PAC, and you staple it. That is how we're doing these things. So you're right. Until, until the FEC can handle the easy questions, I don't have a lot of faith in their ability to handle the hard ones. Um, where I disagree, uh, full disclosure, I'm, I'm a corporate litigator by training, which warps your mind permanently. Um, but I, I disagree with you on the SEC. Uh, initiative. Um, there hasn't been any rulemaking on it yet, as I'm right, sure yeah. you're aware, yeah. um, though I'm, I'm sure I'll see you when there is. Um, the problem I have with it is this. It's, right, it's, it's true that shareholders, I mean, there's, there's a lot of question on this, but, you know, own the company or at least the residual value of it or however you want to characterize it. The thing is that, you know, Citizens United talks about shareholder democracy as a way uh, of handling these things, and there has been shareholder democracy. There have been I think something like 25 elections last year, where shareholders were asked, would you like us to disclose our political spending? And every single one of those elections failed. And I think that's the problem with the SEC coming in. The SEC is coming on and saying, oh, the poor shareholders can't take care of their own interests, so we're going to force this sort of disclosure. No, the shareholders don't want this type of disclosure. And they don't want it for a couple of really obvious reasons. One is that it basically means that every single annual meeting turns into a referendum on, you know, the sort of political role being taken by the corporate world generally. And obviously, that's a bit of a distraction. It's not good for shareholder value, and shareholders probably don't want it. And secondly, to the extent that this creates 
transaction costs for the spending of political money by corporations, whether directly or through PACs or whatever. It essentially is a sort of unilateral political disarmament by the business community. And I mean, I'm not necessarily taking a, a normative position on this, but I'm saying to the extent that shareholders themselves don't want this information and don't want to turn their annual meetings into a circus, I think the SEC has a responsibility to respect that. And that's sort of my view on that. I think it's an end run around actual shareholder issues. Actually, let me just rebut that very quickly. Of um, one, I think that it, in all respect, is extremely disingenuous to say that shareholders are not interested. The fact of the matter is, is most of us don't know where all of our shares are. We're invested in mutual funds. Um, I am not a corporate litigator, so you understand the structure of these investment vehicles much better than I do. But I do know that it can be extreme. I mean, you know, you have a pension that's being invested on your behalf. There's all sorts of ways that money that could be yours is being invested in corporations, and you don't actually know. I'm not saying that a change to SEC rules would be the silver bullet, um, and nor do I think that that's the only change that should come about. I do think that that, to me, strikes me as extremely low-hanging fruit. Publicly owned corporations are transparent in many, many, many ways, and um, you know, I can, I, I could understand a debate about. I mean, I'm, I could understand a debate about having to vote on specific expenditures, but making these corporations disclose the, their political spending and giving shareholders at least the ability once a year to say, you know, I'm comfortable with my money being used for political purposes or no, I'm not comfortable with my money being used for political purposes. I mean, I think that that baseline um, is, is hard not to support in my opinion. But okay. nor do I think that's a silver bullet, just to clarify. 30 seconds? This, 30 isn't, seconds. this isn't a courtroom, but, I know, but, but, <laughs> but 30 seconds. Um, I, I'm not going to use the word disingenuous, but uh, I do think that, I think it's very difficult to draw the line on what exactly is political when you're talking about a corporate budget. I mean, the fact that, you know, $10,000 in direct political spending is somehow should be disclosed to shareholders and a multi-million dollar, you know, negotiation with a union or the decision to build a plant in a particular place isn't. Um, I just think that's, that's kind of a weird line. I mean, corporations do things all the time that are hugely politically risky. And to the extent this is a question of what sort of political risk are shareholders willing to you know, take on, I think you also have to have votes for everything else. But of course, that's no way to run a corporation, which is why we don't do it that way. Mm -hmm. but. So uh, open to questions. Hey, thanks. Uh, if, if we could move beyond a theory for a second, we got a primary in Florida in eight days. I mean, how, how do you crack that nut, especially when you move beyond the big guys like Restore Our Future? Like, how do you figure out who's giving them? I mean, probably Eliza's the best for this one. Yeah. Well, I w wanted to just comment briefly because the topic of this forum is will super PACs determine the 2012 election? And that's the one question we really haven't answered. And I'm going to give you my answer, which is I do not think that super PACs will determine the presidential outcome. I think to the degree that they've played a role, they've accelerated existing trends, but are not probably going to be definitive. I, I do think where super PACs could really play an important role is in close House and Senate races. And I think if you talk to any number of the House or Senate candidates who lost in 2010, quite a number of them will point to super PAC expenditures in very large amounts that had the effect of swamping their own expenditures, sometimes at the last minute. Many of them are very shocked. So I think that super PACs are important, but I would say, um, Keep an eye out for other vehicles that will be utilized shortly. And I think we saw some, uh, here it is. Uh, in the 2010 elections, um, super, 80 super PACs spent $90 million in the 2010 elections, of which 60 million went to elect or defeat federal candidates. Uh, so, you know, and, and of, although there were a large number, well, relatively large number of super PACs, only a handful of them were, were particularly active, where they were putting in, you know, millions and millions of dollars. Is there anyone else who wants? at this question, or we'll move on to the next one. I, I just want to sure. comment briefly, which is that you can go to the FEC's website and see the disclosure reports for the actual discrete expenditures. But again, the rule there for whether or not they have to tell who gave them the money to make that expenditure is whether the donor gave them the money for the purpose of furthering the ad that is the subject of that disclosure report. So you're going to get dollar amounts for how much each super PAC is spending. You're not going to get any information on the donors until, at best, the end of this month when they have to file their um, first report of this calendar. It actually year. coincides, I believe, with the date of the Florida primary, so, the 31st. Yeah, so 
no good information on where the money's coming from prior to the Florida primary. Slightly better information, hopefully, going forward. I'll jump in briefly on that. Sure. I mean, I, again, taking all these points, and this, this is just more of a whimsical observation. Um, I think that when that information does come out, no one's going to be particularly surprised. I mean, I think that's part of what's, what's funny about this debate to me is everyone is, oh my God, who put a ton of money into Rick Santorum's super PAC so that he could, you know, suddenly be competitive? It's going to be supporters of Santorum. I hate to break it to you. You know, and, and you know, people, I, I saw a, an exchange on TV uh, maybe a week ago where someone said, well, you know, what's in there that's actually going to change anyone's vote? And you know, the, the guy actually said, well, what if Big Oil gave a bunch of money to Rick Santorum? I don't know how to tell you this. No one voting for Rick Santorum is bothered by Big Oil. You know, this, and, and so, I mean, I'm not saying that necessarily eviscerates anything that's been said here, but I just think that at the end of the day, it's not going to be that surprising. Uh, I just, for a couple of seconds, I just want to say, well, if that's the case, and it may be that it'll be non-controversial, it sort of begs the question why all these groups at the last minute changed their reporting so they wouldn't have to report it. I mean, if it isn't a big deal, why not just come out and say where the money came from? All right, the gentleman in the blue shirt. Hi, thanks. Uh, Sam Garrett from the Congressional Research Service. Thanks to the panel. Um, I hope you didn't address this earlier, but I'm wondering about 527s, as most people understand the term. Of course, super PACs are 527s for tax purposes, but there's been some speculation that maybe super PACs are yesterday's 527s. And I'm wondering if now that super PACs are available as an option for unlimited contributions for IEs, is, does the panel have any thoughts about whether 527s, as most people understand them, groups like Swift Boats or America uh, coming together, will those now essentially uh, go away or be less prominent in favor of groups like Super PACs? Thank you for the question, by the way. Thank you for the CRS report as well. It's been incredibly helpful in preparing. I actually have part of your uh, cheat sheet in front of me to help me keep all these entities straight. <laughs> Mimi, do you want to take? Sure. Um, although, Paul, jump in if I start getting my uh, IRC rules confused. I mean, the very odd answer to your question is 527s and super PACs are typically one of the one and the same. Um, super PACs and actually PAC in general refers to an FEC label, and essentially the FEC sticks that label on you if your um, primary purpose. So you'll know the exact word, Paul. Primary purpose, I think, is to influence election results. Am I right, basically? Yeah, major, major purpose. Major is, purpose, yeah. yeah the, the FEC test is major purpose. The IRS standard yeah. is primary activity. Primary activity. So the very confusing thing is you still have to organize your organization under some thread of the tax code. Most of them organize as 527s that have the primary purpose of influencing elections. Um, so no, super PACs actually haven't changed much about 527s. What has changed is um, it, with Swift Boat and in earlier elections, we saw 527s resisting being labeled as a PAC. And the reason that was significant is because by resisting being labeled as a PAC, they were resisting the contribution limits um, that largely don't exist anymore and the source limits on prohibiting them from taking money from corporations that largely don't exist anymore, and the disclosure rules. I would just um, elaborate. Yeah, I think the simple answer is yes to your question. Super PACs are taking the place of 527 groups. 527 groups as we referred to them, which was actually referring just to a right. so, the small subset that did not show up at the FEC and register as PACs. They were declining to register as PACs to evade contribution limits and source restrictions on corporate union money and that's all now legal. There's no more incentive. And, and those 527 groups, some of them got in some pretty big trouble. The FEC concluded that most of the big players in 04 violated federal campaign finance laws. They just didn't announce that until 2006 through 2007. Um, but now all that activity is legal. There's no more incentive to stay away from the FEC. Uh, although, actually, I mean, if anything, maybe you've seen a shift to the 501c4s because um, these groups, you know, if they're skirting the line on what's their primary purpose, and they can hold on to the C4 designation, or they plan to dissolve before the IRS would ever get it together to investigate. You know, they can kind of do the same thing, but avoid disclosure on top of it. 
The uh, fading of 527s is interesting, though, because as we know, that was a term of art that referred to certain types of groups that were political organizations as defined by the Eternal Revenue Service, but not political action committees as defined by the FEC. And the way they got to do that is they didn't use terms like vote for and vote against. And as I said earlier, the 527 organizations were very different from super PACs in the sense that they didn't engage in explicit campaign messages. Um, they did disclose their receipts and expenditures eventually to the Internal Revenue Service. And I actually think they're a great example when we talk about it, disclosure of one way to approach disclosure because initially they didn't disclose. And members of Congress like John McCain uh, said, you know what, we want these groups to disclose and we're going to do it through the IRS. And at the time, a lot of reporters like myself said, oh, no. Because the FEC, for all its problems, has a reputation for making public records available to journalists and helping them sift through them. And the IRS does not. The IRS does not have a tradition of disclosure, probably for good reasons, because they don't want people pawing around in your personal tax records. Um, but having said that, after the fines that were imposed uh, against a lot of leading 527 organizations, including the Swift Boat Group and including America Coming Together, a lot of donors said, we're not going to play this game anymore. They were spooked. They didn't think it was effective. They moved away from 527s anyway. And now that there's a super PAC option, uh, I don't think you're really going to see people spending their money in that way. As Mimi said, to the extent that there's an alternative to the super PAC, it's going to probably be a, a social welfare or a trade association organization. I'm getting the impression that investigations don't seem to be all that likely, at least through the FEC while they're deadlocked. But I don't know, is that is it accurate, or, is, or are they still going to investigate um, you know, misbehavior? Well, the, the first step in launching an investigation is getting four votes among six commissioners to find um, reason to believe that the law was broken. That's what law, you file a complaint, or the FEC staff identifies what they think may be a violation of the law. They go to the FEC, the commissioners themselves, and say, Will four of you please vote yes to start an investigation? And that has happened with uh, less and less frequency in the last two or three or four years, and we've seen increase in deadlocks. Okay, so actually in that respect, it's very similar to the lobbying rules where basically nobody ever gets prosecuted, although not quite as, as extreme. Well, my uh, question is uh, mainly about um, what Mr. Dickerson was saying about uh, the 50% efficiency cut in political contributions. Even if that were potentially the case, at least from my perspective, it seems as if there is still uh, you know, quite a great um, investment in political contributions. Number one, potentially high rates of return, given the fact that the federal government as a whole controls, you know, can influence your profit margin potentially by hundreds of millions or perhaps billions of dollars. And uh, number two, the fact that because of you know, enormous wealth concentration, um, there's really not that much of a risk. I, mean, I believe the donor to Newt Gingrich is a billionaire, and even the $5 million he gave was kind of, in some ways, a drop in the bucket for him. So I guess I was just kind of curious as to your perspectives as to, I guess, how good of an investment uh, you know, uh, uh, donating to these uh, independent expenditures would be. I'm trying to figure out which, which way to address that. I mean, it's, it's, it's an excellent question. Um, I think I am going to, to zoom out a bit in answering it, um, and feel free to draw me back in if I'm being unfair. I think a lot of the confusion is about this concept of corruption. When the Supreme Court talks about corruption, they're talking about something very specific, and this was alluded to earlier by basically everyone on the panel, which is that you know we're talking specifically about a quid pro quo agreement where I'm giving you a contribution or I'm doing something for you and then you're doing something in return. Now, a lot of that's already covered by bribery statutes. Um, but the reason that there's, there's sort of a, a prophylactic rule surrounding it is that the you know, Supreme Court has recognized, probably fairly, that there are, there are ways to hide this. And so we've decided to draw a bright line rule at, contribution, uh, bright line at contributions. Now, where I, where I sort of run into trouble, um, and this is more of a philosophy seminar discussion than it probably should be, is that you know, it's, it's not about whether someone feels they owe you their election or whether someone feels a certain amount of gratitude for your support. It's about whether or not there was an actual corrupt bargain. And I, I know that that sounds like I'm splitting hairs, but, I mean, but think about it. I mean, at the end of the day, all democratic politics involves a certain amount of you know, trading of, of support. You know, a, it, it's, it's, I think, unquestionable that when George Pataki was, was elected governor of New York three times, 
uh, with the support of major unions that had never supported Republicans before, that he felt a lot of sort of, you know, obligation or support or gratitude towards those unions. I'm sure it's true that, you know, when, heck, internally, I'm sure that when, uh, when, when Speaker Boehner was, was elected Speaker, that he felt certain, you know, uh, gratitude towards people who had helped fund the majority. That's just politics. And we're trying to, and if you try to make that illegal, you destroy the ability of people to actually have a functioning democracy. Maybe that's too far out, and maybe if you dig down, you can find a fair rule that distinguishes between um, actual corruption in the sense of, you know, I'll give you $5 million and you approve my mm -hmm. Walmart um, in your hometown, which I think we all agree is massively illegal and people should go to jail for. Um, and, you know, this bigger question of, you know, Pataki probably was a much more pro labor governor than you know, the Republican Party was used to. Um, and I don't, know how to, I don't know how to draw that line. I don't know if that answers your question. But can, I put, can I push you a little bit on that? Sure. So, and, and you guys would know better than I do, but isn't the phrase corruption or the appearance of corruption? Mm -hmm. So it isn't just about doing wrong. It's about giving people reason not to trust in the democratic system. I think that's an extremely fair point. Um, and on, I mean, this is a bit of a hobby horse for me, but I think a lot of the problem with this area of the law is that, you know, all this stuff goes up on preliminary injunctions or, you know, someone comes in and waves, you know, an affidavit that's three pages long and mm -hmm. says, you know, my constitutional rights, blah, blah, blah. So the Supreme Court has never, to my knowledge, been asked to pass on the question of what constitutes the appearance of corruption. And there's been, you know, what, what, what academic work has been done, um, which, I mean, I'd be the last person to suggest that, you know, a tenure piece uh, should define the Constitution for us. But what academic work's been done has suggested that, you know, there, there is this, this worry about corruption, but that when you actually drill down, the amounts of money people are talking about are generally not the 200 or 500 dollars. You know. Let, let me push you again on that. Sure. So, these decisions, you know, it's it's not made by academics, but Congress goes through a hearing process. They make a number of findings. Um, they make a determination about the law. They pass the law. Then the courts will give some kind of deference, depending on how they feel, uh, to the determinations made by Congress. So this is really the role of Congress to do the investigation to find out where the lines are, to draw the rules. I mean, they're the ones who are most susceptible to, you know, most subject to these pressures anyway. Well, and you'll notice that oftentimes, I mean, this, this was basically the debate over, you know, part of the challenge to, well, all of these laws has generally been, I mean, going down to back to Buckley, is, you know, this question of, you know, is the contribution limit too low? Is $1,000 1976 dollars corrupting? Um, and, you know, the, the court has occasionally hinted that, you know, it might not be. <laughs> it's probably true that $1,000 doesn't buy anyone. Thank God. Um, but we're, we, don't, we don't have a scalpel to probe whether, you know, to use the phrase, you know, to probe whether $1,000 or $5,000 or $10,000 is appropriate. So, I mean, I think, I think there is a deference to that idea. Um, but I also think that the phrase, the appearance of corruption when you're talking about uh, fickle and unmeasured public opinion is a very dangerous way of doing constitutional law. I'd actually, just really <laughs> oh yeah, me too. I'd, um, I think it's undoubtedly the case, that might be a touch too strong, but borderline undoubtedly the case that five justices on this Supreme Court would agree with Allen's definition of corruption. But that wasn't the case as recently as 2003, when in the McConnell decision, the court did not only define corruption as um, a little bit more expansively to mean corruption, the appearance of corruption, they also said that undue access and influence that results from the making of big contributions um, creates corruption. That is corrupt. And they referred to the definition of corruption that Allen just articulated as a, quote, crab view of corruption, close quote. What changed was Justice O'Connor retired and Justice Alito joined the court. And it's in Citizens United where you see a pretty dramatic narrowing of what had it as recently as 2003 been defined as corruption, meaning undue access and influence as well as um, actual quid pro quo stuff. Now it's been narrowed as Alan has indicated, but that's a pretty recent development. Mimi? No, I was gonna say that I completely agree that you know our democratic system is premised on individuals trying to influence other individuals to push policy in some direction. And clearly, you know, we will always be probably more willing to listen to our friends than our enemies. I, I do think that there is a huge difference when you're talking about particularly a for-profit corporation spending money to influence election results. Because a for-profit co corporation is extremely different than you and I. I mean, you and I are very complex creatures. We have all sorts of motivations. We also have 
kind of larger senses of wanting to make our community and our country a better place. A for-profit corporation, I mean, by law, it has one goal, and that is to make money. That's not a bad thing. Making money is a great thing, and there's also, it's also a huge part of our country. But I don't think that that goal should be confused with making policy. I think that is an extremely dangerous situation to be in. Just two brief comments. One is the contribution limit is actually now $2,500, not 1000 and it's been indexed for inflation, which I actually think is one of the very good things that happened with the McCain-Feingold law, because it had the effect of bringing more regulated money into the system. Um, I think it should be noted that the same lawyers and advocates who endorsed and championed Citizens United are now pushing for a whole new set of changes in the law and they're challenging the existing contribution limits to candidates and parties. And Mitt Romney has been very candid about this. He said, you know, these super PACs have all this power and money. I want to have that power and money too. That would be the solution, is to level the playing field. So that really will put it to the high court, whether they want to go against what the Buckley court said. In 1976, after the Watergate scandal in Buckley v. Vallejo, the Supreme Court said, we believe that there is a sufficient public argument in favor of limiting contributions to candidates and parties that we're going to let these laws stand. Um, and I am not sure whether, from a constitutional perspective, uh, this court would approve or disapprove, or even should approve or disapprove, contribution limits being eliminated to candidates and parties. But based on the reaction to Citizens United, I would be very surprised if this nation accepted that. I think that there's a limit to how much voters will swallow. I don't think voters want to see us go quite that far. I see a lot of dissatisfaction with Citizens United already, and I think if you tried to get rid of the contribution limits to candidates and parties, that members of Congress would hear such an earful from their constituents that they just wouldn't accept that. And on that exact point, uh, there was a survey that just came out by the Pew Research Center on January 17th that said that 54% of registered voters are aware of the Supreme Court's decision allowing unlimited independent spending on political ads. And of those voters, 65% think that the changes in the rules are having a negative effect on the 2012 presidential campaign. Uh, and with that, unfortunately, we are out of time. <laughs> uh, I'd like to thank all four of our panelists that, for doing a fantastic job today. Um, I probably should thank uh, meta-journalist Stephen Colbert for help bringing attention to this <laughs> issue. Uh, I'd like to say that the next ACT event is scheduled for March 12th and will focus on access to legislative data. More information about this end event, of course, will be available on C-SPAN's website and also at transparencycaucus.org. Thank you all so much. <laughs>